Hello Mike, thanks for joining me today. Now I'd like to start by looking back over 2010. It's been a tough year for many industries, so how have you seen pharma perform? Well, pharma had a good year actually, um, growing at around 3.8% um, in value terms, um, which is a very good performance by any other industry if you benchmark it against um, you know, any other I think, industry that's out there at the moment. Uh, that was mainly driven by specialty care. 7.7% um, of that growth was, was from oncology, and specialty care overall drive 90% of the growth. Primary care was probably flat or you know, grew at 0.4%, and that was mainly in the diabetes area and respiratory. Generics grew the volume. 75% um, of the volume actually came from, from, from generics, so that was a, a real driver in terms of volume. Um, but I think it does reflect some of the challenges that uh, that farmers facing now with the declining impact of launches, um, the dramatic shift in the stakeholder power, um, but also uh, you know the, the impact starting to come through of the government changes, which I think looking forward, those are things that are really going to shape um, the marketplace moving forward. If we look forward now throughout 2011, what kind of growth do you see for the industry and where do you see as the real opportunity areas for pharma? In terms of overall growth, I see you know, probably flat, maybe even some, um, some slight decline in the, in the very near term, 2011-12 sort of uh, time frame. Though, those sort of uh, declines are, uh, are due really to the impact of the changes that, um, and the reforms in the NHS. The change over to a value-based pricing mechanism, potentially in 2013, which I think is going to cause a lot of uncertainty. And we've got a lot of patent expiries coming up in the next couple of years, which will certainly drive, uh, you know, drive down growth. Um, as we know, the, you know, the generic penetration rate is very high um, in, you know, in the UK. So I think you know, in the sort of near term, there's a number of challenges, which I think will... Um, you know, really uh, drive down the growth, if not even take it uh, into negative. Um, but moving out of that sort of time frame, out to 2012-14, um, I do see um, a lot of opportunity. Uh, there's a, a lot of actually primary care um, portfolios are coming through in that time scale. And if pharma has the right um, strategies for launching, um, can work with the government in this new value-based pricing arena, um, I think they can really start to maximize the potential of, uh, of the new products that are coming in. Um, but that does require them to look at their commercial model um, and see how they're going to evolve over that period of time. And there's quite a lot of change that needs to happen um, for them to be successful. Um, but I'm sort of more confident um, you know, in the sort of medium term uh, that, that, that growth will return. And I think the UK will continue to be you know, a, a vibrant market for pharma, although it will have its challenges probably in the next one, one to two years. How do you think pharma can best realize these opportunities then? Well, they really need to look at the market and the, the way it's changing. Um, the commercial model will need to change. The way that uh, you know, incentives, the way that people are driven, the way that they look at the marketplace overall, will need to really focus around outcomes. Um, moving forward, this is sort of a bedrock of, of things like value-based pricing and to really understand um, the impact from an outcomes point of view of, of, of any new drugs that come onto the marketplace um, is the way that the government want to shape the NHS and farmers really got to understand what impact that will have on the commercial model. So how do you drive internal processes to ensure that you're, you know, you're working in that environment and that will that will make some changes, you know, moving away from things like, you know, changing market share and shifted market share, those types of things um, won't be the measures that will be needed in the, in the new market. But there's some real opportunities here because I think, you know, the, the NHS changes, are, you know, are far from certain now. And if, you know, pharma engages in the right conversations and starts to, you know, lead some of the thinking in area in this area, they can really start to drive some, you know, some unique collaborations. Um, which I think is the way that uh, the NHS is looking to move forward. So how can they partner best with the NHS itself, 
with hospitals, with uh, you know universities, etc., in the research of uh, in research and development fields. Those are the types of you know collaborative strategies which I think pharma needs to start uh, looking for, and then really looking at the cells internally just to make sure that they understand this new environment, what are the potential impacts of the, the changes, the shift away from uh, PCTs to GP consortia the new stakeholders, how to engage with them, what sort of things are they looking for. A lot of these things are still open, but, you know, pharma is now going through a process of, you know, uh, of evolution, and they need to scenario plan how this would work out. Whilst we don't have all the, uh, the facts and figures right now, it's that change in thinking that I think, uh, you know, a number of the innovative pharma companies are starting to look at. And it's about how do you collaborate and then change your operational model to meet that um, in the future. Now, we're talking about the changes which are happening in the UK market with the NHS structure. There's a lot of uncertainty still there. So what kind of NHS structure do you think we will end up with when the dust has settled? Well, I think, you know, the structure seems to be pretty much there in terms of a you know an outline at least and i know that you know we've had a recent pause in the um in, you know in, in the nhs um well, and the health bills progression through parliament but i think you know i don't think there'll be some big structural changes within what is proposed i still think that uh, the decision making powers will be pushed further down towards the gp um, maybe there will be other people, you know, involved in that decision. So it won't be solely GPs. I know that, uh, that you know, there's talk of having more hospital people on those types of panels, and also maybe members of, uh, you know, local government involved in that. But I still think the principle of actually, you know, uh, the uh, the GP or the front line, you know, decision making being pushed to the front line will continue, um, and that's really where pharma needs to start thinking about the scenario plan. What does that mean? Who are the new stakeholders? What sort of information do they need? What, how do they want to be approached? What is the partnership model that they're looking for? And how can I help them achieve their goals? Um, and you know, looking at it just wider than you know uh, the clinical benefit of a particular drug that's been introduced, but also how is it going to benefit these other stakeholders? Um, so reducing hospital admissions, reducing social care, those types of things need to be taken into account. So, you know, I think um, whilst I think the structure is pretty much set there, and I don't think there'll be a, a, a big change in terms of that. How it's implemented might well change, and you know, I think you know uh, it would be a the right thing to do now is to try and model what each of those different scenarios would be and what's my plan, what's my strategy for that moving forward. So at a high level, with the, all this background of change going on with the NHS, how do you see the industry adapting to this new environment? What key changes do you see them making? Well, as I think I've already touched on, you know, this sort of move away from just, just the clinical benefits um, of a particular drug um, and we're looking at the wider impacts um, and outcomes uh, basis is going to be the, the key move. So how do you, you know, adapt your business model in that environment to, to firstly, you know, communicate your messages, but also understand how you develop your, you know, your trials in that environment. Now, there's been some good examples where pharma has worked, you know, uh, with the NHS. Um, I know in COPD, for example, there's been a lot of um, good work in reducing hospital admissions, in particular PCTs and areas like that. And I think that's the sort of environment that pharma needs to start thinking about and how they can engage with this um, new, new NHS and, and really help them, draw, you know, move that forward. I think there is a leadership role that, that the pharma can, uh, that can play there. Um, and that's you know that's key to them being successful in the future is you know how do how do they operate in that environment? So as the industry develops and explores these new ways of working with this new environment, how do you see that changing the way that critical service providers work with their pharma clients? I think in the same way that pharma has to, you know, we've all got to evolve in this new environment, uh, whichever part of the healthcare system that you work in, and you know, really understanding, you know, the new dynamic, um, 
the new demands um, within the NHS and the pressures that, that they're under in terms of cost reduction um, by really mapping that out and understanding how um, you know, service organisations could add value to the NHS and, and to pharma moving forward is, is critical. Um, and we spent a long time looking at this from an IMS point of view because clearly with a big focus on outcomes type information, uh, that, that type uh, of information is not readily available, it's not collected in, in the right formats and I think there's a lot of things that, uh, that we can do working with the NHS and pharma um, to enable that to happen because outcomes uh, data by its nature is, is very different between different therapy areas. Um, there is some information that's publicly available. There's other information that's, uh, that, that's more restricted. But actually, the, beginning, the bringing together of that information to provide the insight um, is going to be critical moving forward because if we're going to operate in a, in a value-based pricing environment, understanding outcomes in its broadest context is, is going to be critical, critical moving forward. And, you know, pharma... Um, needs to make those arguments um, up front in terms of you know the benefit of any uh, new launches that they have but also moving forward um, they need to be able to make sure they can measure the performance against those and uh, and make sure that you know once a price is agreed and a mechanism that uh, under which a new drug is, is 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 prescribed actually that is you know carried through within the NHS there's been a lot of reports recently where where drugs get nice approval but they still there is still this lack of uptake and there's still this regional variation clearly if farmers going into a, a value based pricing environment they want to make sure that they get the uptake when they have proven their case to make sure that's driven through the NHS so understanding all of these different dynamics certainly from an IMS point of view will be critical moving forward so we're talking quite a bit about outcomes data which requires new information new ways of pharma presenting that information I guess the key question here is, do you think farmers are ready for that challenge? I think they're ready for the challenge. I think, have they got the tools to do it right now? Um, probably not. And, you know, I think this is um, over the next two years where a lot of work's got to be done in terms of really understanding how this new environment is going to operate who are the key stakeholders, who are the people that are going to be making the decision, and then what information do they need to make those decisions um, and you know, get the clarity at a launch point. But then also, and I think this is very critical for pharma, how do you get the follow-on from that to make sure that you know, if, if things are agreed, prices are agreed, that if there is a, um, you know, the volume follows that, because I know there's been a lot of... Um, you know, uh, nice recommendations that haven't necessarily been followed and, and they don't always get the uptake and it varies by different region. I think some of these are some of the big topics that I think need to be, um, you know, need to be grappled with. And I think the industry and, and the NHS need to, you know, start to agree what outcomes actually means and what is the platform, what are the benchmarks um, that we're going to be able to define what is good and, and, and what is poor. Because um, I think pharma would uh, want to know that as quickly as possible to make sure that they're investing in the right areas. So I think the next couple of years, you know, it, it, there is a real opportunity to really define what this means and to test this partnership principle um, and really understand whether, you know, uh, the NHS is up for that, because if they are, then that's the way that we are going to be able to deliver the benefits to the patients at the end of the day, and that's really where we need to make sure we keep, continue to focus. Mike, thanks very much for your time. It's been great speaking with you. Thank you, Paul. Great to speak to you again.